study registrations, pre-analysis plans, PAPs, and registered reports, RRs, are tools to increase the credibility of scientific research. This is why they are particularly important tools for research that aims to guide policies. They are public documents that pre-specify the hypothesis a researcher will investigate, the details of the research design, and plans for data analysis before the final data collection is completed. They may also be used to describe data from a pilot study or from a baseline data collection. There are two main reasons these tools are useful for increasing the credibility of scientific research. One, they limit publication bias and specification searching. And two, they increase the reproducibility of the findings. And there are other benefits. They allow for smoother teamwork and they help researchers produce better data for the purpose of meta-analysis. This graph is meant to show that pre-analysis plans, or PAPs, are becoming increasingly popular with rapidly increasing trends in usage in the last decade. Let's start with an overview of these tools, what they have in common, and how they differ. I will describe the gradient from a study registration to a PAP to an RR. Study registrations are for publicly declaring one's intention to undertake a study that investigates a particular hypothesis. PAPs go beyond study registrations by providing details of how the proposed analysis is to be undertaken. RRs are a type of a PAP required by some journals with specific guidelines to follow. They go through a peer review process at the journal, and if invited to submit a full paper, the journal commits to publish it before findings are known, based on the contents of the RR and conditional on the researcher sticking with a pre-specified plan. So far, PEP PERI programs only required study registration, a prerequisite for submitting a report in most journals. In the next funding rounds, a proposal is made for mentors to work with teams to produce a PAP based on the pilot study, research design, and baseline data collection and prior to final data collection. In this way, the researchers will have the possibility to submit their RR to a journal. Even if they choose not to, writing a PAP between baseline and endline data collection is a time saver, as all that will be left to do to produce the final research report or article is to fill in the blanks. We are done for now with generalities. Let's go through an example to see how the tools for open science can help produce and publish better research. We will do so by focusing on one particular case study, the Go Bifo program in Sierra Leone. The research article on which I based this discussion is titled Reshaping Institutions, Evidence on Aid Impacts Using a Pre-Analysis Plan, written by Catherine Casey, Rachel Glenerster, and Edward Miguel, and published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, Volume 127, Issue 4, 2012. Many development projects also aim to build and strengthen social organizations with the objective of making the impact sustainable, so that once the program ends, beneficiaries have the capacity to find and implement their own solutions. The study I will discuss now is an impact evaluation of the community-driven development project called Go by Fo, implemented in Sierra Leone after the Civil War. My objective in presenting the paper is to illustrate the relevance of PAPs. There are two components to the program. The first takes the form of grants to fund local infrastructure development, such as community centers, schools, latrines, or roads, or agriculture or business training projects, all according to the community needs. The second is about investing in local decision making. This is done through intensive training for minority inclusion, the fostering of collective action, and the empowerment of marginalized groups. This naturally led researchers to evaluate the impact of go by fro on multiple outcomes broadly categorized as hardware, improvements like the building of latrines or implementation of an agricultural project, etc., and software, 
improvements such as a trust or a local collective action, etc. The researchers designed and implemented a randomized control trial, RCT, in order to identify the causal effects of GoBIFO with a minimal set of assets. Casey et al. found positive effects on hardware outcomes, but mixed results on software improvements. It would have been easy to cherry pick the outcomes that exhibited a positive, for instance, a statistically significant effect, ignoring the others. It would have been easy to cherry pick the outcomes that exhibited a positive effect. Uh, It would have been easy to cherry pick the outcomes that exhibited positive effects, for instance, statistically significant, ignoring the others. But this was not possible because the researchers pre specified an analysis plan detailing, among other things, all their outcomes, primary and secondary, measures, and strategies to deal with multiple testing. Let me show you some of the findings in more detail. The first table shows evidence that the quality of institutions declined as a result of GoBIFO. Here are some of those outcomes. On line 1 of panel A, 84% of the control group did attend the meeting to decide what to do. The impact was a 4 percentage point increase for those in the treatment group. On line 2, 51% in the control group reported that everyone had an equal say and the treatment negatively affected this outcome. It was 11 percentage points lower in the treatment group. So, they are more likely to participate in community meetings, but less likely to experience equal participation by everyone. The rest of the effects are not strong in magnitude and only marginally significant. Based on panel A, it would be easy to conclude that the social engineering component of the program was not effective and that the program actually backfired by weakening social institutions. Now let's look at another set of results. This second table presents evidence to the contrary. Based on another set of outcomes, the evidence is that GoBIFO resulted in better local institutions. The authors conclude that the evidence on the impact on local institutions is mixed. But as you can see, it would have been easy to pick up results that supported the hypothesis according to which local institutions worsen, consistent with local elite capture, or the one according to which they improved, consistent with higher capacity for collective action from the participatory approach to development. The authors actually looked at 334 different outcomes. They show how they could have picked seven outcomes that made their program look like it strengthened institutions, or they could have picked six alternate outcomes that make the program look like it weakened institutions. I must admit that this is an ideal setting for a specification search, as the concept of a strong institution is an elusive one, in the sense that it is difficult to quantify. That said, even when there is only one outcome, pre-specifying the outcome, along with the research design, is incredibly useful. Take, for example, profits on agricultural yield. There are so many different ways of measuring such an outcome, and each of these ways reflect a choice of the researcher, his or her bias. Even if the study does not suggest multiple outcomes, properly defining the outcome of interest is good discipline. There are many other examples like the GoBIFO project in the literature. Here is a selection in various thematic areas. Health economics, the Oregon health insurance experiment, evidence from the first year, by Amy Finkelstein, Sarah Taubman, Bill Wright, Mira Bernstein, Jonathan Gruber, Joseph P. Newhouse, Heidi Allen, and Catherine Backer, 2012. Poverty targeting. Targeting the poor. Evidence from a field experiment in Indonesia. By Vivi Alatas, Abhijit Banerjee, Rima Hanna, Benjamin A. Orkan, and Julia Tobias, 2012. In the Job Market Program. The Impact of Vocational Training for the Unemployed. Experimental Evidence from Turkey. By Sarah Jeannie Hirschleifer, David McKenzie, 
Rita Almeida and Christabel Riedel Canal, 2015. Now that I hope you are convinced that these tools are useful, let's see how to use them. Study registries are centralized databases of all the attempts to conduct research on a certain question, irrespective of the nature of the results, so that even null or not statistically significant findings are not lost to the research community. There are a number of renowned registries. The main two are clinicaltrials.gov and socialscienceregistry.org. Clinicaltrials.gov is for medical research. They have 380,049 research studies in the U.S. and 220 countries have been registered since 1997. SocialScienceRegistry.org is the American Economic Association's Randomized Control Trials Registry. It was launched in 2013 and currently lists 4,732 studies from 159 countries. The PET PERI program has requested PET-funded studies to register with socialscienceregistry.org. Others that may be of interest are REDI and EGAP. The first is the International Initiative for Impact Evaluations Registry of Impact Evaluation Studies conducted in low- and middle-income countries. The second, known as the Experiments in Governance and Politics, EGAP, registry, is used by social sciences doing empirical research in political economy. Now, let's describe the process of a study registry at the social science registry, the one Pep Piri uses. First, you'll be happy to know that a study registration is free. It is a prerequisite for report submission for most journals. There are required fields that are public access and optional ones that may be hidden from the public but obtained upon request. The submitted registration is reviewed. This review process is a very light one. It is only meant to check that the required information is provided. Importantly, the registry will be made by the principal investigator or investigators, PI. He or she has 15 days to finalize the submission after the review. PIs should register the trial and collaborators, with permission from PIs, can then edit it. Prior to the study registry, the PI should seek the approval of each person to be listed as team members, and the role of each must be clearly defined to avoid issues later in the process. Trial registration is electronically timestamped for a journal submission. The date and time of the final submission of the study registry is recorded and the PI will get proof of registry, a serial number unique to each study, with the date and time at which the study was registered. When should the PI register the study? It can be done at any time, but it is best to do it once the proposal is funded and before the research work actually starts. Note that the registry can be withdrawn. When submitting the research, journals will require that a reference be made to the auto-generated citation. As with most scientific research, a study registry is in English. Please check spelling and grammar if you are not a native speaker. Also, as in any research piece, please do not use acronyms without explaining what they mean. Let me start to describe the contents of a study registry. Identify the study with a title and specify the country, at least one, where the study takes place. Identify the PIs with name and contact information. Identify the study status. For instance, it could be in development, planning phase, ongoing, completed, or withdrawn. Of course, the status can be changed as the study moves forward. Provide keywords with at least one from a pre-specified list, for example, agriculture, health, education, etc. Provide an abstract with the study's objective, main outcomes, interventions, levels of randomization, eligibility criterion, the population of interest, the sample size, and the treatment assignment mechanism. Provide a timeline with the trial and intervention start and end date. 
And here are some more contents. When you're asked to specify the outcomes of interest, you should provide some details on outcome variables or indicators of interest for the trial, that is, those for which impacts will be estimated. A description of the public experimental design. It should include the empirical model, treatment groups, and number of arms or variants of the treatment, target population, sampling, and how the subjects will be enrolled in the trial, as well as the sample size. The randomization method may be computer-based and organized as a public lottery. It may require pairwise matching, etc. The randomization unit can be the village, the health center, household, or an individual. One should also discuss clustering, the issue of treatment compliance or take-up, the possibility of attrition, and how all of these inform the final sample size by each treatment arm. An ethical review of the study is also typically made, and the study registry will then record the IRB approval number. For more details on these required and optional fields, I will direct you to the AEA registry website. Compared to a study registry, PAPs are more elaborate documents with more information. The objective of PAPs is to provide details on how the research will be conducted so that another researcher could replicate the study. PAPs should be written before final data collection. It can then work as a commitment device. PAPs have the structure of a report and are at least 10 pages long and up to 40 pages long. About one-third of trials in economics now have a PAP. PAPs require more work than the simple study registry. This work is in addition to the work researchers do at the proposal stage. But having a PAP helps save time in the later stages of the research. Because impact evaluation studies are time-intensive, pep PERI projects last for 18 months. Having a PAP is also useful to keep track of the enormous amount of information gathered and organize it in an efficient way during the months between baseline and endline data collection when there is not much to do for the project. More specifically, clearly defining the variables will be useful for designing a questionnaire, mapping every specification of the empirical model to the specific questions in the questionnaire, that measures the variables in these equations will limit omissions. For example, once data is collected, if you forgot to ask a question, it is too late. And survey fatigue. How many of the 200 questions asked to respondents will end up in the research publication? And it saves time and money. With a PAP, data analysis is much quicker and easier once the final data is collected. This is also true for paper writing. A PAP can serve as a basis for clear instructions to research assistants on how to conduct data cleaning and preparation. It also reduces ex post disagreements between co-authors. For example, I told you we should have asked this question. I don't think this is how we define the outcome of interest. All of these questions would have been debated and agreed upon with a written report to attest for it. After all this work of designing the study, the questionnaire, piloting them, fielding them, getting the data ready for analysis, the last mile will be made simple. At that stage, you simply need to follow the roadmap in the PAP. There's no single template for PAPs, but all share the following elements when it comes to the contents. We covered some of these when describing the contents of the study registry. A PAP is more elaborate in the sense that it actually includes more information than a study registry. Here's a simple outline to follow. 1. Abstract. Introduction. 2. Description of the intervention. Table of contents and a research hypothesis. 3. Description of the research design and statistical power, expected attrition, sampling data, primary and secondary outcomes, covariance for heterogeneous impact analysis, empirical model, variable definitions, balance checks, parameters of interest, 
Adjustments for SE. 4. Data Collection Section. Plan Data Collection. Instruments, Timeline, Ethical Considerations, Field Challenges, Data Processing. 5. Others. Research Team Composition, Deliverables, Calendar, Budget. As you can see, the PAP already includes many of the elements that will be expected in the research article. Parts 1, 2, 3, and some of Part 4. Now, let's focus on one of the items in the outline in Part 2, namely the description of the intervention. This item is often poorly described in most impact evaluation studies, so we will spend the next two slides on how to do it better. The description of the intervention becomes informative when the researchers follow the tidier guidelines where TIDIER stands for Template for Intervention, Description, and Replication. This makes replication easier. It consists of a 12-item list and covers the description of treatment arms conditions and the control conditions. The guidelines are described in a British Medical Journal publication by Hoffman et al., 2014. T-I-D-I-E-R T-I-D-I-E-R. This table is constructed based on the checklist table in the original paper. Let me go through them one at a time. This can be used as a checklist to assess if the intervention description you made is complete. 1. Provide a name for the intervention. 2. Why? Describe the rationale for the main elements of the intervention. 3. What? Materials. Describe the materials used in the intervention and provide information on where the materials can be accessed. 4. What? Procedures. Describe each of the procedures, activities, and or processes used in the intervention. 5. Who? For each intervention provider, describe their expertise, background, and any specific training given. 6. How. Describe the modes of delivery, for example, face-to-face. -face. Describe the modes of delivery of the intervention, for example, face-to-face, -face, and whether it was provided individually or in a group. 7. Where. Describe the type of locations where the intervention occurred. 8. When and how much. Describe the number of times the intervention was delivered and over what period of time, for example, number of sessions, schedule, duration, etc. 9. Tailoring. If the intervention was planned to be personalized, describe what, why, when, and how. 10. Modifications. If the intervention was modified during the course of the study, describe the changes, what, why, when, and how. 11. What could be improved? Describe plans to assess or improve the intervention adherence or fidelity, how and by whom, and if any strategies were used to describe them. 12. What went well? If the assessment is completed, describe the extent to which the intervention was delivered as planned. In the previous couple of slides, I intentionally focused on how one should describe the intervention in the PAP, but the same level of detail is expected on the other items in the PAP. There should be enough detail that someone external to the study team should be able to entirely replicate the study. Again, let me provide you with a non-exhaustive list of items you should be particularly careful to describe in the most thorough manner. Sampling. Describe the target population, the sampling scheme, and the sample size. Research design. Describe the method and the level of randomization. Add the detailed power calculations. Be specific about how parameters were chosen. What is the expected level of non-take-up? Attrition. The description of the variables. What are the variables to be included in a randomization check and a sample attrition test? Primary and secondary outcomes of interest. 
how you go from the concept to the measurement and ultimately to the construction of the variables for the estimation table. Heterogeneous impacts. Pre-specify subgroups. Clarify the concept. Explain how it will be measured and how the actual variable will be constructed. Analysis. The empirical model should be made fully explicit. Write the equation you want to estimate. How to deal with multiple testing, variables with too little sample variation, and adjustments to be made if there is selective attrition, etc. The next natural question is how to archive the PAP you produced. It could be archived and timestamped as additional material on the AEA registry or at the Center for Open Sciences COS Open Science Framework OSF, which allows for essentially any study or research document. It will also have a timestamped web URL. Here is a diagram that illustrates the process from an RR to its publication. Compared to a standard publication process, there is the in-principle acceptance in green stage. It is akin to a conditional acceptance which some editors may give at the last stages of the revision process. Here, the in-principle acceptance stage occurs before the study findings are even produced, based on the relevance of the research question, the potential contribution of the paper, and the rigor of the research design. Note that even with an in-principle acceptance, the PI can withdraw the article at a later stage. More importantly, an in-principle acceptance ensures that, regardless of the study findings, the study will be published on the condition that the researchers followed the initial plan described in the RR and justify any deviation from it. Now for the last tool in the toolbox, I should say the ultimate one, the RR. RRs are peer-reviewed PAPs. In other words, a PAP is an RR before it is submitted for review. Once it goes through the review process, the PAP becomes an RR. Journals usually commit to publishing the paper based on the revised RR. Journals will only ask for revisions if the RR is above the bar. Each journal will have its own guidelines on how to write the RR. Here is a list of journals that can be of interest to researchers in economics in the social sciences and have an RR track for publication. Journal of Development Economics, PLOS One. Nature Communication. They publish short pieces by economists. Here are some additional useful resources. Time to conclude. Study registries, PAPs, and RRs are new tools to increase the credibility of scientific research, limit the cherry-picking of research findings, and limit a journal's publication bias against null results. These tools are often used with randomized trials, but can be used for any study testing hypothesis using statistical methods on observational data. Some journals offer special submission tracks for RRs. Even if a report is not submitted to these journals, PAPs remain powerful for producing rigorous and replicable research.